for questions. We'll see if we have time for questions and answers. Um, so if you have questions for our presenters, the slide will have their contact details, which we will also share on our website. Please follow up with your regional lead if you want to learn more about getting involved. And you can also find this information on the conference website. So without further ado, we're gonna to go to our first speaker uh, who is representing the Ibor American uh, Network, uh, Anna. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, well, it's a pleasure to stay here with you and um, uh, I'll do my best communicating with my poor English, but if uh, any question, any clarification you need um, at the end, I'm, I'm going to give you my email and um, I can uh, give you in the chat also. Well, I'm sharing um, a presentation. Oh, sorry, I can. I can share my presentation, but I don't know why. I think we decided that we were just going to. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. okay. It's okay. Oh, okay. there we go. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, well, uh, I work in the, in the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos, Rey Juan Carlos University in Madrid, Spain, uh, but I, I was working in, in Latin American countries for five years and uh, I was uh, involved in the process of um, uh, uh, Okanaga Charter in the, in the writing committee, in the drafting committee um, uh, in 2015. Um, this, uh, this short, very short presentation is trying to, uh, no, it's, oh, well, it's trying to, um, so, uh, the, the, um, Ibero-American network is, um, involving, uh, 10 national networks, 10 different networks, well-established and, ad and active, uh, seven networks in progress, 108 institutions in total. And, uh, we have, uh, organized nine international conference. Uh, next conference, uh, will be held in Portugal, in Coimbra first time in, in Portugal, and we uh, develop uh, six documents, six agreements, declaraciones, we, we call it, uh, and uh, we translate some of them, most of them uh, in Okanagan process uh, into English. These are the, um, um, the well-established uh, uh, networks, national networks, but also we have some um, uh, for coming, some, some networks that are um, in progress. You have the uh, institutions in each country. Uh, we have uh, organized all these uh, conferences, international conferences, each two years, but uh, last year was uh, uh, organized in Coimbra, but uh, because of COVID, it was impossible and we... Um, uh, uh, we are uh, having a meeting in uh, Portugal uh, next October. Okay, these are the declaration, the documents. And what about uh, strategies and challenges I, I, I put together? Because it's uh, very important, our our first lesson, our first uh, strategy is collaboration, cooperation, and uh, participation. Uh, as Alma Ata declaration says, uh, for us, uh, health is impossible without participation. So we have for you, for everybody, an open uh, toolbox uh, uh, for sharing knowledge uh, in, inside our network, our network of networks and uh, we can share with you if you if you want uh, 
we are um, focused in transform health promotion into promoting health in these strategies that for us are in these 20 years uh, working are uh, important health promotion incorporate into university strategic plans at all levels improve health and wellness services in each institution in this in some countries this is very important uh, systemic action and networking is also important. Accreditation system or certification of uh, health promoting universities. Globally desirable, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a proposal, it's something um, to think about it. And as I said, cooperation. In, in Irama Royos, who is the president of this network, um, uh, he says uh, to maintain an active network in practicing health advocacy and social responsibility at universities. This is my email and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Anna. We really appreciate it. It's so nice to hear from somebody from such an established uh, network and for some, such a large, large region. And we really do appreciate you coming to this English speaking group um, and, and sharing Sorry. all of that with us. No, it's fantastic. My English. <laughs> no, it's great. You did a fantastic job. Hazel, uh, if you could, you're up next with the UK network. Thank you, Rebecca. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Good stuff. Okay. I don't have a slide, so I'm just going to chat on for a few minutes if that's okay. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you uh, for, for having me. Um, thank you to the organisers for organising and giving me the opportunity to speak about our network uh, on behalf of my UK network colleagues. I'm very much enjoying the conference um, and I'm looking forward to, to the rest of it. It's currently seven o'clock here in the UK, so it's nowhere near as bad as some of the times I've just been chatting to colleagues 3.30 in Australia. Um, so... Um, I'm glad I'm, I'm still here and I hope everyone else is still feeling okay. Um, so just a brief update really to start with on the UK network and a little bit about myself. So I'm Hazel, um, I'm actually my job title is Wellbeing Services Coordinator and I work in a university in the northeast of England um, and I'm also a public health professional and I've worked in public health for over 20 years. Um, Mark actually asked me to do this presentation. I'm in a slightly unique position in that I've been a member of the UK network for around 15 years, um, which is, is quite a long time. I've worked at um, my university for 16, nearly 17 years. Um, so I'm just going to share a short update about our network, um, as well as, as we've been asked to do, two recommendations um, as to what has been effective in growing our network and a challenge that we've faced and how we've overcome that challenge. So when I first begun uh, my membership of the network, um, it was actually called the English Universities Network. Um, and that was about 2007 or eight. Um, and it's actually now growing into a UK wide network with interest globally. Um, we started the network informally in 2006 with around seven people around the table. Um, and then our, there are now 89 full members from UK higher education providers. There's 28 associate members from non-UK universities and 33 associate members from other UK stakeholder organisations. Um, and that is one of the strengths of our network that we've got that great collaboration across the sector and from organisations outside um, and external to, to the higher education sector as well. Um, we used to have a steering group who coordinated and managed the network, just the one group. Um, that, a lot of that fell on um, everyone who you know, Mark Duris, Professor Mark Duris, um, who we're very lucky to have as the chair of our network. But a lot of that work did fall on Mark and his team at UCLan. Um, now we actually have two groups. We've got an advisory group and a leadership group, um, a new leadership group. So the advisory group consists of a variety of higher education institutions and other influ influential representatives from related organizations, such as Universities UK, the Office, Office for Students, National Union of Students, the leadership group, one of the members is myself. We have five members from four different higher education institutions, and we are now responsible for managing and coordinating the network. And this includes planning network meetings, communications, growing the network, maintaining the network. Um, we also have two task groups that we've recently set up, one looking at communications and one looking at new ways of engaging with our network. Um, for example, webinars and other type learning event type events. Um, there are lots of exciting developments um, and moving forward, we'll be continuing to offer a mixture of online and face-to-face -face network meetings and learning events. Uh, we usually meet twice a year. Everything obviously over the last few years during the COVID pandemic has been online. 
Um, it's important to note as well that membership is free of charge and involves a commitment to the principles, vision and aspirations of the 2015 Okanagan International Charter for Health Promoting Universities and Colleges and a willingness to participate in the network and support its vision and aims. So my two top recommendations, um, quite simple really, um, we found that online shorter meetings have gained larger numbers from a wider global audience um, and meetings that are topic based um, with a focus on a particular topic, followed by a roundtable or panel type discussion with Q&A and also importantly time for networking. Our network, obviously, it's really important that they get to share uh, best practice and get to know each other. Um, and a challenge that we're faced with um, that we've overcome is really being able to do what we do, grow the network um, and meet on a regular basis and do everything that we do um, on limited financial support and resourcing. Um, we still manage to do that. We still manage to grow the network. It's very much down to enthusiasm and commitment, especially from our Professor Mark Duras and his team and other colleagues from across the HEI sector. Uh, again, that's collaboration, which, which has been a big topic of today. One of the reasons we have the new governance structure is to support um, that, that, that growing network. Um, and it's, um, for example, we've got support from UUK and the Office for Students as well within the advisory group. The network is also highly valued across the sector, and we hope to continue its growth and continue to promote healthy universities, health promoting campuses and the Okanagan Charter across the sector, lo locally, nationally and globally. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Hazel. We're so honoured to have you here with us. We really do appreciate that. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, I'm going to kick it over now to Tyler in Australia. Hi everyone, uh, a very early morning over here. So it's currently 3.47 a.m. So uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to present to you all and thank, to, thank you to the organizers for setting this up. Um, so uh, my name's Tyler, I'm in Australia. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land that I am on, the Kamaragal people. Um, Australia is one of the, has one of the longest living indigenous populations and it's important to recognize that they um, were like in Australia are on unceded land. There was never a treaty um, and their rights and recognition and sovereignty um, is what I would like to acknowledge before I start today. Um, and I'd like to pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging. So the um, Australian uh, Health Running University Network is an interesting one. So to give you a little bit of an understanding is um, about uh, end of last year, I get dragged into a meeting and um, uh, it was with some colleagues at Western Sydney University and we're about to restart up um, the Australian Health Promoting University Network. And uh, I get dragged into this meeting and I'm like, oh, this is actually really exciting. I've been involved in the um, building health promotion across uh, University of Technology Sydney um, for about uh, since 2018. And so I jump into this meeting, looking forward to working with some of the colleagues. And um, they actually, uh, my colleague from UTS uh, didn't join the meeting. Um, and I'm sitting there with two colleagues from Western Sydney that I've never met before. Um, and they are actually handing over <laughs> the Australian Health Promoting University Network um, chair to myself, uh, which I did not expect. So it's been a very interesting ride. We are very fresh. Um, so off, off the back of the Okanagan Charter um, in 2015, there was a bit of a momentum, I mean, as you expect, around trying to build a health promoting university network in Australia. And a large group of universities came together, kind of uh, as everyone did, uh, to commit to the Okanagan Charter, set up collaborations and a network. Um, I can see it was about 20 universities across Australia um, that committed to that. Um, however, uh, due to resourcing, due to a lack of commitment, that kind of died out. And so here we are uh, quite a few years later, um, I, I guess started in 2021 with our first meeting where we actually had some pretty good attendance ship across um, the, the nation, which is fantastic. Um, and we have just recently had our second meeting. So very, very early days here compared to where a lot of people is at. And I think that talks to one of the biggest challenges for us over here, which is, uh, I guess, a lack of commitment in a sense, um, where we have a lot of um, challenges, I guess, in the university sector with a high rates of casualization, like everyone. Um, and the kind of 
health promotion aspect, um, those that are working in health promotion directly are more focused on what's happening in community and in um, like primary and tertiary care populations. Um, so there's some challenges there. What's working really well, however, is we actually do have very, a lot of grassroots kind of initiatives that do pop up, um, which is fantastic across lots of different universities. And so um, our meetings so far have really been building some really great connections across those who are very passionate and enthusiastic, as Hazel referred to before, um, and sharing some of those chat, like how we have been managing to embed some of these initiatives across different universities and sharing those wins, um, which has been fantastic. Where do we go from here? It's really building more momentum, um, building more momentum, getting a lot more of those conversations happening. Um, and the other thing that has worked really well here at my university, just in terms of health promotion in general, um, is getting that really high level buy-in. And so myself, I was a social lecturer position and now actually into full-time PhD. So it's really about me building my connections and leveraging um, those with a more higher standing in different universities um, to really promote and uh, essentially build a lot bigger buy-in and commitment across the university uh, and universities in Australia. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of commitment on the grassroots level, but I think as we can see over the last two years, a lot of people are very burnt out. And so it's really trying to balance a lot of different competing demands um, as well as universities trying to prioritize um, their stand, like the new way of working, um, which in Australia is very kind of business focused. Um, but some things have worked very well. There's lots of universities that have recently set up um, well-being strategies in the last few years, which is fantastic. Um, it's a little bit uh, to the adjacent, um, but it's on the right track. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tyler. I don't know if Liz has been able to join us yet. We've got Liz that's supposed to be with us from the New Zealand network. I know it's the middle of the night there. Liz, are you on? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and, and move to uh, present the US uh, network. So once again, my name is Rebecca Kennedy and I'm a licensed psychologist and the assistant vice president for student health and well-being at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I am the chair of the US Health Promoting Campus Network. Um, our network is fairly new. So I'm gonna provide a bit of brief history uh, in my brief update. So the network held its first convening in New Orleans, and that was January of 2020. That was at our NASPA Strategies pre-conference session. And out of that meeting, several campus representatives met again in April on Zoom, of course, because the pandemic had begun uh, to discuss uh, building a national network and a steering group. And so that's what we did. We formed this steering group um, that was going to kind of lead this process. And interested campuses began monthly meetings in November of that same year. So again, just a really a brief time after the pandemic. That's when we were kind of kicking this whole thing off. Um, we got our first institution, which was here at UAB to formally adopt the charter in December. And then we had a summit that following February of 2021 featuring Dr. Mark Doris and uh, Dr. Matt Dolph as speakers. And so by March, more than 40 campuses were actively involved in the network. And in September of that year, 2021, we had seven institutions that formally adopted um, the charter, which was just fantastic. So since then, the network has grown to more than 75 campuses, and we have 18 campuses that plan to formally adopt the Okanagan Charter this fall. We have developed a work plan that has four priorities for the network. First is the Okanagan Charter adoption. Second is communication, awareness, and advancement of the network and charter. Third is to build and support the U.S. Health Promoting Campus Network, and four is to establish our governance. So our activities are organized really around these priorities, and uh, some of our significant accomplishments include the development of a national website, a Google Drive to house shared resources, a brand utilizing the symbol of the American Bald Eagle, a national listserv, an adoption process, and then these monthly network meetings and the two national summits. So we have a couple of very active work groups. One is our social justice work group. They're developing a diversity statement and discussing possible land acknowledgement for the US Health Promoting Campus Network in addition to working to diversify the network. 
We also have a governance work group that is developing our terms of reference and leadership succession plan. We have also adopted a cohort model uh, as a way to give network members an opportunity to be part of a smaller group. So cohorts are by adoption year and those meet once a month as well. So as for our top two recommendations on what has been effective, um, the first is to develop a highly committed steering group. Our group has met every Friday since April of 2020 from three to 4 p.m. Central Time, and that is a serious commitment. Uh, in addition, each of the steering group members has taken on a tremendous heavy lift of work to move the network forward. Our steering group has, um, has always been transdisciplinary. We've got five distinct academic preparations uh, in that group, and we've learned much from one another, and each has contributed their talents and their resources to really found this network and grow it to its current size. Our second recommendation is to continuously address equity and to customize for local context. So our country is just beginning to acknowledge colonialism, slavery, and the continued systemic impact on a higher educational system that was largely created for the male children of white wealthy landowners. There is much to be done in the US to create a campus culture of compassion, well-being, and social justice. We are a work in progress and network members uh, have done an outstanding job of committing to calling one another in, as we say, helping one another to recognize institutional and personal resistance to change uh, and the need to promote change and dismantle structural racism and systems of oppression. One challenge that we're faced with in the US is the competitive culture. Um, and certainly that competitive culture occurs between campuses um, in terms of athletics, but it also uh, is in terms of um, competition for the same students, faculty, staff, grants, and, and many other resources. We have a highly capitalistic country, and although universities do share much of their innovation, technologies, and knowledge for free, there are also a number of forces that really do significantly reinforce commercialism um, or the creation of capital and wealth in exchange for expertise or consultation. So although we um, may agree with the idea that we're all interconnected globally, um, I think the U.S. can also be a little bit focused sometimes on what impacts us and those we know and care about personally. Um, the U.S. Health Promoting Campus Network, unlike professional organizations in the U.S., it is free to join. And we are developing a culture in which we share with one another freely our innovation and knowledge. So uh, at this time, I want to see if Liz has been able to join us. I think we may have a, a crossed wire then in terms of the time, or it's just in the middle of the night um, uh, there. So uh, let me look at the time here and see. We've got we've got at least ten minutes uh, that we can spend on um, answering some questions. So I'm going to throw this out uh, to our group here, if we could. Um, what do you find most difficult in keeping the momentum going within your network? I'll go. Sorry. I couldn't unmute myself. Because <laughs> um, we generally have um, a couple of meetings a year. Um, obviously, they've been online recently, but historically, they've been in person. It's keeping that engagement in between meetings, because I think, I don't know about you guys, but I find that um, you kind of go along to, to these things and you, you're in with, you know, your own tribe and your own people that you feel really, you know, connected with. And then you come back to your institution and you, you go back to all of the sort of the challenges and things that you, you kind of deal with on a day to day basis. Um, and then it kind of go back to it again. So what we're doing now is that's why we've created the leadership group and we're creating um, we're going to create like a program and we're looking at different ways of communicating with our network so we can keep them engaged in between. So on it all of the time rather than just people dropping in going away again and dropping in again every now and again. So um, we're looking at sort of just improving that, uh, that communication and that engagement. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think that um, the process in the Iberoamerican network is something different from your processes that you, that you explain, uh, but uh, we feel, um, 
uh, we feel that it's very difficult to have, a, for instance, a salutogenic approach. A salutogenic approach is very difficult for us. And uh, we were working in, in social determination of health, not, not determinants, determination of health, that is a concept developed in, in Latin American countries. And, and it's, it's a model, uh, um, I mean, it's something more integrative, more abarcative, and it's not easy in so different countries. We have um, 17 different national networks now. So it's very difficult because different cultures in each culture, in each country, and, and all these uh, situations that, that we say before about participation, collaboration, and all these um, uh, helping processes that some people in, in, in an initial process is, uh, is being helped by other people with, uh, with um, more developed uh, uh, networking. I think this uh, salutogenic and integrative uh, approach is, uh, is very difficult to, to reach. Thank you so much. I probably agree with yeah. Probably agree with Hazel. It's about the um, connection between um, that's quite challenging. And so again, we're very very early on compared to everyone else. Um, but I find um, in those early days, it's really important to build those more personal connections um, with those that are part of the network. Um, and so for those that have been have come to the last two meetings, um, again super early on, uh, it's been good to get to know them. Um, but then a few months pass and because it's someone you've only met once or twice before it's it's that remembering um of who are they how how do they show up and um, what do they really care about um so yeah i think the key thing for me is probably just learning from uh you both uh, all three of you um and trying to implement probably a bit more regular because at the moment we we're kind of going on a th quarterly um so probably bumping that up a little bit using those shorter meetings as hazel kind of talked to Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think here in the US, um, you know, we've tried to adopt that cohort model so that people have sort of that smaller sort of group. We've got the opportunities for folks to participate in the work groups as well, which are meeting on a regular basis. And then we do have that sort of standing monthly meeting. And I think that's um, really helped. But in terms of kind of what I think we find most difficult in keeping the momentum going, you know, it's... Um, uh, it's all the other competing priorities and the fact that we have not been able to meet in person yet. So um, I think that that's something that we're really looking forward to as a network. There's uh, many of the folks in the U.S. that are part of the U.S. Health Promoting Campus Network are also part of professional organizations that have national uh, meetings. And so there's actually one coming up uh, here at the end of May and early June. And so that'll be the first time um, that we'll have been able to be together since um, January of 2020. And we've grown so much since then. And so um, that's been, I think, one of the biggest struggles is just this um, not being able to be in person. There's something about getting to know folks on Zoom versus getting to know folks um, sort of in between sessions and sort of sharing a meal and um, those kinds of things. So. Let's uh, see if we can fit in one more question here, at least. Um, what are a few lessons learned that you might share? In particular, uh, Anna and Hazel, I know you guys have been at this for such a long time. And so if there's any little morsels or lessons learned for the folks that are listening, I know that we would all greatly appreciate that. Um, there's probably so many, but... <laughs> um, from the network's point of view, definitely talking to your members and, and, and keeping in contact with them to find out what it is they're interested in. Um, you know, so that when you do, because like I say, we run, we run topic-based um, meetings so that there's always uh, like a keynote speech uh, from, an, from an expert. Um, and it's got to be topical to the current landscape of, of higher education as well, so that it's something that they can get some takeaways from it and they can go away and actually put that into action when they go back to their own institution. Um, and that then will, you know, lead to, to them, you know, maintaining their interest. In, and that's why I think the, our members really, really do value the network because they really, you know, learn something, something from it and, and get something out of it that they can tangibly use 
and, and take back to their own institutions to, to make a difference. And I think just um, the, we've, we've just done a survey as well, which is, is um, something which we're, and we're going to start doing, like say, those more regular meetings, like you said, Rebecca. So I think that's all going to going to help as well. Um, so, so the other the other thing I think would it sort of ties into the other question you mentioned in the breakout group, mind, but um, that sort of idea of mentoring of of supporting other institutions who are maybe earlier on in their journey. Um, and, and you know, there was some interest in the breakout room around um, you know whether or not other institutions could help you know from an international network perspective um which was was quite an interesting uh, suggestion i thought um so so yeah i'll leave it there thank you hazel for me for me lessons learned it's about um uh, i always say uh, with one spider you don't have a net because in some national networks it's very difficult if you if you don't have the key person, the key person keeping, maintaining, sustaining, and this sustainability is very, very, very difficult. For me, it's uh, uh, something that I see in different countries with different cultures, with different um, um, system, health systems, educational systems. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a common, it's a common um, situation that we, with only what one person it's impossible to maintain a, a a network and this is a well it's, it's a difficulty about, it's very difficult for us uh, in in some countries with uh, only only few very small groups uh, working to to maintain this uh, situation yeah mm -hmm. I actually don't think that's dissimilar um, from really anywhere in the sense that, you know, you often have a champion that sort of brings something to a, a university or you have a vice chancellor or a president that is the champion, you know, or that that really leads that. But if you have that top level leadership change out, then that can really stall things on your campus. I know that's some of the feedback that I've gotten, you know, just not at the network level, but at the university level that, okay, you know, this president is really invested in these things, but, but will the next sort of be invested in these things? But I think also on a network perspective, you know, just in the short time that we've been doing it, you know, since uh, really kind of opening it up November of, of 2020, we've had a number of folks that have changed institutions. Um, and some of those um, folks, then the next institution they're at is a very active member, um, but it's been hard to sometimes, you know, keep that same momentum, you know, from the institution that had signed up as an institutional member, but doesn't have that same champion that's there. And so I think it's, it's not unusual, actually, for there to, you know, um, for us to need, need to create more champions on our campus, you know, and to really embed it into the strategic plan and embed it into um, sort of the fabric of the university so that um, being a network member is part of what the university is doing, not part of what a particular champion that happens to work at that institution <laughs> is doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's gonna be a challenge for everyone kind of everywhere. Tyler, anything you wanna add to this conversation? No, like, as I said, like it's super early days for me. And so it's, I think it's been great listening to the different ways in which you're kind of tackling it. And I think I've got a lot of things that I've taken away to really kind of get going. Um, but while you, you've got, um, kind of opened it up, anyone who does have collaborators in Australia that is really passionate about this, I'd love to uh, get in contact. There's only one of me so far. And so I think um, the key thing is building that potentially like that steering group is one of the key elements. So anyone who has really passionate collaborators in this space, please send them through. Fantastic. I know we've just got a few more minutes and I just want to really capitalize on the fact that, you know, Hazel and Anna have been at this for such a, a long time. And I know Hazel, you said you, you know, you have so many lessons learned. Um, I'm just going to turn it turn it back to the two of you to give us a, a few more. We've got two more minutes left before we uh, transition. And so if you could give us another nugget or two. You're putting pressure on now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, um, you know, 
core to the whole system approach is that leadership buy-in, isn't it? So it is it is really important to have, have that. Um, from In my experience at my own institution, um, that hasn't always meant the vice chancellor necessarily or the president, um, someone in the senior executive team, um, because they can be a champion for your um, healthy campus or healthy university um, work that you're doing. Um, something else that I've found worked really well is collaborating with, um, especially, and again, it's different in different countries, but our public health, um, local and regional um, teams, because obviously there, was, there are shared visions and shared objectives when it comes to health outcomes within your populations. So we had a large project a few years ago where we received quite a large amount of funding um, because it was all about healthy settings and the local public health teams wanted to um, basically create health improvement across the population. So they approached the largest organisations within the area where we're based um, because they were the ones that were the biggest opportunities to be health promoting organisations. So it's it's for me, really important to find those key people who can um, be the, those champions, those advocates, um, especially at a higher level, um, to really help you be able to take it forward and also create. Um, I mean, there's lots of information on the Healthy Universities website. If anyone's ever looked on it, it's healthyuniversities.ac.uk. Um, guidance packages, um, case studies lots of research papers. Um, so there's some really useful information on there. Um, but, you know, really identify those people and put a, um, a, a some kind of leadership group in place. Um, just even if you ha don't, haven't got a single coordinator, um, there's always, and recognise that the, the impetus will always come from a different part of the institution as well. It's not yeah. always going to come from student support. It might come from a research team or one of the particular faculties. So yeah, there's lots. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Hazel. I just want to, you know, it's time to wrap up. So I'm going to thank all of our network presenters. Thank you so much, uh, Tyler and Hazel and uh, and Anna. We really do appreciate it. And uh, I'm sorry, folks, that we um, uh, lost out on Liz. I don't know what happened there, but, uh, but hopefully um, you can connect with her. The information is there um, on the screen. Um. Liz Hosking Clement from the New Zealand AO to Aotearoa Network was able to join us and will give us a three to four minute overview right before we go to break. Um, and then after that, we will reconvene again at 3 p.m. So I will hand it over to you, um, Liz. Thanks, Georgia. Uh, so kia ora tato or greetings all. Uh, ko kohu kohunui te maunga, that's kohunui mountain is my mountain. Uh, kohunua te awa, te awa is the river that I um, relate to. No tamaki aho, I am from Auckland in New Zealand. Ko Hoskin Clement toku Fano. Uh, Hoskin Clement is my family. Uh, ko Liz toku ingoa, my name is Liz. Um, that is a pepiha, that is our uh, Māori who are Indigenous people of New Zealand's traditional way of introducing themselves. Uh, as a way of letting people know who you are and I guess building connections um, with each other across New Zealand or globally. So that is my uh, pepiha to you all for me today. Um, my biggest apologies that I missed my time. I'm going to blame the fact that I'm recovering from COVID um, and international time zones and daylight savings is hard. Uh, I am a nurse by background and I work in the University of Auckland as the manager of student conduct and care, which goes across our Be Well team, which I've got um, my little icon in my background. Uh, but I'm also an exec member of the Tertiary Wellbeing Aotearoa New Zealand group, which is the other um, uh, picture I have on my screen. Um, so in terms of kind of big things for New Zealand at the moment, uh, in January of this year, um, government kind of uh, within the Education Act released a new pastoral care code. Uh, this was in response to some pretty awful incidents that had happened to tertiary students in halls of residence. Um, and so this uh, code and legislation has come out um, and mandated uh, tertiary education providers across New Zealand with a way of providing uh, pastoral support, well-being support, health promotion activities uh, to all tertiary students, including a specific um, set of requirements for international students as well. Uh, so end of last year, all of our 
uh, institutes were doing gap analyses. Um, and this year we've been looking at implementing um, all of the new things that we need to, to be compliant under this new code. Um, what I would say has worked really well in TWANS um, over the last couple of years since I have been involved is just the sharing. Um, I've come from a DHB background as a nurse and in uh, government health sectors, people are often very protective of the resources and the things they have created, usually because those things have been attached to money from government. Um, and it was really nice to see that actually moving into a tertiary education environment, people were really willing to share the things that have been created, the resources that have been developed. And so um, there's been a lot happening to address sexual harm, um, to look at drug harm reduction. Um, and we've all been sharing our resources, our contacts, the material that we've developed um, so that we can then give it our own flavor within our university, but use what is often sometimes quite sparing resources um, with the most impact um, in being able to build relationships with each other um, as well as the other experts in this area. So that's what I would say has worked really well. Um, and the biggest challenge for us of 2022 so far has actually been COVID. Um, so Omicron really was New Zealand's big um, moment in the sun for COVID. And so all of us have been grappling with large numbers of students um, and staff members becoming positive and how we support students. And I'm sure it's going to be no surprises to this group that going back to the basics and providing um, money for financial hardship, food parcels, medication um, has been the thing that we have found has really worked and provided our students with the most benefit. Um, but I'm so glad I've been able to to come and meet you all today and present really briefly on what um, TWANS has been doing. So thank you for giving me some time.